I now invite you to take your Bibles and we will read together from the book of Revelation, the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ to the Apostle John, and we'll read a part of that revelation from chapter 12. So let's turn now to Revelation 12 and read beginning at verse 1. The first verses of this chapter, verses 1 through 6, will serve as our text for this morning. So Revelation 12, beginning at verse 1, and a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of 12 stars. She was pregnant and was crying out in birth pains and the agony of giving birth. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and on his head seven diadems. His tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she bore her child, he might devour it. She gave birth to a male child, one who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. But her child was caught up to God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness, where she has a place prepared by God, in which she is to be nourished for 1260 days. Now war arose in heaven, Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought back, but he was defeated, and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who was called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world, he was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down who accuses them day and night before our God. And they have conquered him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. For they love not their lives even unto death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them, but woe to you, O earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you with great wrath, because he knows that his time is short. And when the dragon saw that he had been thrown down to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. But the woman was given the two wings of the great eagle, so that she might fly from the serpent into the wilderness to the place where she is to be nourished for a time and times and half a time. The serpent poured water like a river out of his mouth after the woman to sweep her away with a flood. But the earth came to the help of the woman, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed the river that the dragon had poured from his mouth. Then the dragon became furious with the woman and went off to make war on the rest of her offspring, on those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. And he stood on the sand of the sea. So far the reading from God's holy word. So let's read the words of our text once more. Revelation 12, beginning at verse 1. And a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. She was pregnant and was crying out in birth pains and the agony of giving birth. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and on his head seven diadems. His tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth so that when she bore her child, he might devour it. She gave birth to a male child, one who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. But her child was caught up to God and to his throne. 
And the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God in which she is to be nourished for 1260 days. Brothers and sisters of our Lord Jesus Christ, a common visual at this time of the year is the nativity scene. I'm referring to that picture or display which depicts Joseph and Mary and the newborn baby Jesus. It depicts the manger, maybe a few shepherds. Even some have wise men from the east, even though they probably showed up a couple of months later. Some even have three wise men when no indication of Bible is that there were even three. And typical of these many nativity scenes is that they are conveying a warmth and a peace and a gentleness. Even though the birth outside is outside the cleanliness of an inn in a harsh barn-like setting. Some even have a supernatural light in these pictures and images where Mary and Joseph and the shepherds and some animals are all peering into that feeding trough with expressions of wonder and joy on their faces and their reflecting light that's coming from this tiny head. Maybe that's portraying that Jesus is the light of the world who brings peace on earth, but that there is even light emanating from him. It seems so unreal. And brothers and sisters, though we may not agree with all the exaggeration that is included in many of these displays, Still, Scripture does present the nativity scene as a joyful one, a scene that reveals to all men and is observed by all men that the Savior is born. There are shepherds gathered around this cradle who are rejoicing and who go from that scene and proclaim the newborn King. Mary, who has heard the reports from the shepherds, what they heard from the angels in the fields, is also contemplative and wondering. Later, wise men indeed do come and offer and worship with gifts. There is indeed something marvelous and awesome about this birth of Christ that truly is the perspective of Holy Scripture. But it is only one perspective of the birth of Christ, for there is another perspective, a darker perspective, a spiritual perspective, or a heavenly perspective, if you will, one that's not so obvious to us. And it's a perspective that seems to stand in contrast to the joyful nativity scene. It's a dark and gory picture of Christ's birth. It's the one that's described in our text, in the vision of our Lord Jesus Christ to John, where Christ's birth is surrounded with hatred and anger, with pain and blood and fire and the threat of death and demons. It is a depiction of the culmination of a long history of enmity and hatred and war, where Satan and his legions are opposing and battling the angels on high, doing all they can to destroy God's plan of salvation. This battle between God and Satan over the Son, over the promise, between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent, we call the great antithesis. 
And that's how we'll also summarize our message today. In the great antithesis, God prevents Satan from preventing the birth of our Savior. So the summary of the message this morning is, in the great antithesis, God prevents Satan from preventing the birth of our Savior. And we'll see three things. The opponents in the antithesis. Secondly, the history of the antithesis. And thirdly, the victor of the antithesis. So first, the opponents. John sees a vision in heaven. He sees a woman gloriously arrayed where the sun is her garment, the moon is her footstool, and there is a wreath or crown of 12 stars on her head. She is pregnant, and she is involved in the hard labor that comes just before the delivery. Suddenly, John sees a great red dragon with a big tail standing in front of the woman. It's a huge, grotesque beast with seven heads and ten horns. So huge that his tail furiously lashes across the sky and the heavens and sweeps away one-third of the stars and flings them down to the earth. Why does this terrible monster stand before her? So he can eat up her newborn child. Does the dragon succeed? No, he does not. For we read also that a male child is born and is eventually taken up away to God and his throne. Meanwhile, the woman flees from the dragon into the wilderness where God cares for her for a total of 1,260 days. That's three and a half years and symbolizes one half of world history, the New Testament age. So we see in our vision then, or John saw, and we, we read what he saw, three main characters who are representing the two sides of the great antithesis, the woman and the male child on the one side against the dragon on the other. The woman we read, was radiant. She symbolizes God's church. And that's how Scripture often describes the church as the woman, as the bride adorned for her husband. Here, she is the church of the Old and the New Testaments. The church from the beginning of history to its end. And in this vision, she is right at the center of church history, crying out in pain for delivery, alone facing great danger. On earth, therefore, we see that the church always appearing vulnerable always open to scorn and ridicule. However, in this vision, there is much promise for this woman, for the church, for the vision from the perspective of heaven is an all-glorious church. John sees a great sign, verse 1. It's a glorious sign, for she shines like the sun in her clothing. She is like a queen who is seated on the throne with a crown of 12 stars upon her head. Some believe these 12 stars represent the 12 tribes of the Old Testament church and later the 12 apostles, and the teaching of the New Testament church. She is a glorious bride, a radiant woman. Secondly, in the second place, the figure 
there is the male child who is born, and, and that represents the Lord Jesus Christ. This male child is the seed of the woman that God had promised, the long-awaited Messiah, born of man, born of woman, born in hostile conditions. However, as the vision shows, eventually this child escapes the furious wrath of the dragon and receives great power. He is brought into God's throne room. He is given rule over all the earth. He will rule, literally it says there, he will shepherd with a rod or a staff of iron. He will use it on the one hand to guide and protect and to ward off danger for the sheep. He will save his sheep with this rod of iron. And secondly, he will use it to judge and destroy and smash the enemies of the church. These words also make us think of Psalm 2. And ultimately, we read in verse 10, the dragon will be thrown down from heaven. And that's the third figure, the dragon, who has, we read, the color of red, literally a fiery color. It symbolizes Satan. He is the great dragon, we read in verse 9, that was thrown down, that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. Or verse 10, the accuser seeking the male child's and ultimately the church's punishment and death. The color red, the color of fire, indicates the dragon is intent on destruction and is covered in the blood of those he murders. Seven heads indicates the fullness of its spiritual cunning and great worldly influence. The crowns indicate that God grants some authority. And ten horns indicate its destructive power. In Ephesians 2, verse 2, we read, You were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, the prince of the power of the air. When Satan originally fell from heaven, we read he drags down one-third of the angels or spirits with him. He is not alone, therefore. He is powerful and has one-third of the spiritual beings that God has created. A large number, not the majority, but nevertheless, a large and powerful army of demons. Others are suggesting here that this third of the stars represents the destruction of the saints, the murder of the saints. It can be a reference to the children of Bethlehem. But this dragon, this serpent, is standing opposed to the woman and the male child. These three characters form and represent the great antithesis of all history. Satan wanting to destroy God's people, God's child. He wants to abort God's saving purpose in them. And that brings us to our second point, the history of the antithesis. Satan, who is the great deceiver from the beginning, seeks to ruin God's creation. And so he deceives, first of all, Adam and Eve. And he becomes the great accuser. He accuses Adam and Eve and all their descendants that they deserve death, and that God in the end has lost. But the scriptures show God promised 
a great salvation. God promised to overrule and overcome Satan. Nevertheless, Satan, who deceives even himself, is zealous to keep on destroying. And so throughout history, no one knows better God's original promise to bring a Savior through the seed of the woman than Satan. Here we are thinking of Genesis 3, verse 15, which speaks of these same three characters. I will put enmity between you, that's the serpent, and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring, that's the male child, he shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. The serpent of Genesis 3 is indeed the dragon of Revelation 12. And the woman's seed of Genesis 3 is the son, the male child of Revelation 12. It's from that very moment that God gave the mother promise in Genesis 3 until the day Christ is born and even beyond that, that Satan is at work to prevent Christ's birth and also the effect of that birth. And thus we see that already in the children that are born to Adam and Eve, this enmity. We see enmity between Cain and Abel. We see enmity between the serpent and the the seed of the woman. Cain, influenced by the devil, slays Abel. But is that the end of the line? Is that the end of the promise? No, no. For Seth is born. In Seth there is new life and there is hope. That's why a little later Satan whispers into the ears of the sons of Seth, Genesis 6, to marry the daughters of Cain. Satan encourages mixed marriages, which nearly brings the church to extinction. That's Satan's method to destroy the church. But no, among the descendants of Seth, there is one who fears the Lord, we read in Genesis, and that is Noah. So when Satan's world is destroyed by the flood, God saves Noah and his family. A new generation arises, strong and resourceful. But not for long, for then in Genesis 11 comes Babel, where Satan, again, is influencing. He is promoting a stronger humanity, a humanity that believes in itself and forgets God. Is that the end? No, it is not. For God scatters the people. And that leads to the lives of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Moses and David and his royal line. Also throughout all these times, sin and doubt and unbelief could lead to the end of the line. But God continues to intervene to fulfill his promise. Even at one point when the royal line is reduced to one. Think also of Judah's downfall in the Babylonian exile. Think of Haman and the king issuing a decree that through his vast domain all the Jews should be put to death. This decree is sealed with the king's ring. The law of Medes and Persians, which cannot be revoked, is it the end? No. The promise concerning the mediator, born of David's line, sealed with the oath of the king of kings, means it will not be the end. So through Esther and Mordecai, God saves the Jews from this decree and prevents the Holocaust that would surely destroy God's promise. And then after the return from exile, the Jewish nation, delivered by God, becomes embroiled in domestic disputes and is overtaken by a number of countries, no less the empire of Rome. You would think now Satan has succeeded, but he did not. 
For in Bethlehem it was proclaimed that the King of Kings is born. Satan, however, is not done. Unable to prevent the mediator and his, and his birth, he waits for that birth and will devour him the moment he is born. So wise men brought, were brought before Herod, and Herod said, as soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. But his intent is to kill the child, to devour him. Herod, who is in the line of Edom, continues the antithesis. But those wise men warned of God returned to their own country by another way. The dragon refuses to admit defeat, and he has all the children two years old and under murdered in Bethlehem. But again, Herod has failed, as did the fiery dragon. For the Christ, the male child, who was also true God, was safe in Egypt. And on and on it went. From the the cradle of Christ to the grave of Christ, Satan attacking the male child, Christ being brought to the cross, Satan attacking, but God preventing the end of the line. And so we understand God's work in history to ensure the fulfillment of his promise as he prevents Satan from preventing the birth and the work of the Savior. And that goes on and on today as well as we read in Revelation 12 that the dragon went on to chase the the offspring of the woman who had fled to the wilderness. And that brings us to our third point, the victor of the antithesis. Beloved, the vision John is seeing is a panoramic view of God's salvation history where God and Christ and his church are victorious. Where God's purpose is never frustrated and the birth in Bethlehem symbolizes God's victory over the dragon. Thus, the Savior's death on the cross, which we said was again the dragon's work, although it appears the dragon's work becomes for God's people the vinyl victory. For the child we read is caught up and snatched up to God and his throne. That is to say, Christ's eventual life and death and resurrection from the dead and ultimately his ascension into heaven and his enthronement as king and ruler of the earth for the church symbolizes that victory. Satan can't prevent the birth of the Savior. Satan can't keep the Savior in death. Savior can't prevent the forgiveness of our sins. And in the end, the Savior is in heaven out of reach. And so we read and we already heard Satan has now redirected his attention on the church. That brings us to today. Satan continues to persecute the woman who has fled And because he could not get at the woman, he goes after her offspring. Verse 6, the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God in which she is to be nourished. And verse 12, the devil has come down to you in great wrath and goes after the offspring of the woman. All this is taking place in this second half of world and church history. But, brothers and sisters, we may take great comfort and assurance today from our text. For though Jesus Christ is opposed, though his church is opposed, 
the opposition to Christ and the church will be treated to the iron rod of Christ. And he will smash Satan. He will smash his legions. He will smash the rulers of this world who rule against the church. And then will be fulfilled, Genesis 3 verse 15, ultimately, that the woman would bruise or crush, the seed of the woman would bruise or crush the head of the serpent. Christ triumphs. His church triumphs. And the angels sing glory to God in the highest. The church rests in God's care. God has a place prepared for her. He will nourish her. Though vulnerable, she is a radiant queen, the bride of Christ, wearing the crown of victory. She belongs to Christ. God will not let the gates of hell prevail over the church. As Martin Luther put it so succinctly, Satan's doom is sure. And therefore, we will not fear. We will not fear Satan's attacks on the church and on his people. We will not fear something like Bill C4. We will trust God. We will administer the truth of scriptures for the healing of the nations. We will rest in the victory that is ours in Christ Jesus. We will know that it is just a matter of time. Christ will return before it becomes too much for his people, exactly when those three and a half years, those 1260 days are up. And we, in that trust, should remain faithful to God and trust him and not assimilate with the enemies. We should flee to God. So what we see in our text this morning, brothers and sisters, as we conclude, is that the birth of Jesus Christ, true man and true God, and mediator of God's people, is representing God's victory over Satan and is the climax. It's It's the center of the history of the age-old antithesis between the seed and the serpent. Christ's birth makes very clear that Satan always has been and always will be the loser. And that the vulnerable church, where we seem to be attacked and we seem to be defeated again and again, is actually and truly is the victorious church. We are on the side of Christ. We are on the winning side. Christ is the king of kings. He is the ruler of all the nations. And God's counsel, therefore, will stand forever. Amen.